there were two things that I'd really like to look at with you. And one of them was the, you know, the obviously personal problem, which is, I think, where our religions are, are deeply rooted in the idea that ultimately you're responsible for yourself. You know, the obsession with trying to change the world without doing the work of changing the self uh, seems to be a hallmark of, of just a, a, a real misguidance um, that a, a lot of uh, people suffer from. But I was, uh, I, I found this interesting quote um, because Aquinas, as you know, considered greed one of the worst. And, and, and because so much, and probably, probably from Timothy, um, the, uh, the idea that uh, philargia, you know, the love of wealth or cupidity or avarice is the root of, uh, of evil. But James Ogilvy said a very interesting thing kind of explaining that. He said, greed turns love into lust leisure into sloth, hunger into gluttony, honor into pride, righteous indignation into anger, and admiration into envy. If it weren't for greed, we'd suffer fewer of the other vices. Well, what that suggests um, was precisely that, uh, that greed is the root of evils. It, it also suggests that we shouldn't interpret greed too narrowly as having to do with material things or material wealth, that what greed consists in is wanting more than is good, wanting more than it is good to have. If you want, uh, if you admire uh, in, a, in a, an immoderate way, that will turn to envy. Uh, if you love in an immoderate way, that will turn to lust. It's the thing that corrupts other things and creates the, seven, the, seven, the six other deadly sins. I think there's a debate. Horace, uh, in his enumeration of the vices, put uh, avaritia uh, at the very top. Um, and, and I think uh, Christianity traditionally put pride at the top. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. And, and uh, Islam debated about pride envy, and believe it or not, sloth, uh, because they felt that uh, sloth, which I, I would translate as a word called ghafla, um, which is a kind of uh, a forgetfulness of one's self so that they don't, they don't engage in the work necessary given the time that we've been given, which is actually quite short, to prepare the soul for this uh, for, for the next stage of the journey. So they kind of debated about these things, but they, they identified envy, and I think envy and greed are obviously related. Um, and in some ways, all the sins have these interrelationships. And I've, I've pointed this out before, but I'll say it again. The, uh, you know, Dorothy Sayers, I think, um, did something important by reminding us that the, to call them sins, which is actually what Gregory, um, Pope Gregory, changed it from the original um, Evagrius' uh, denomination of temptations or thoughts. And, and so the idea that they're really the seven capital states of being, hence the, the, they're mortal, they're deadly because you're in that state. It's not like you lust one time or you have greed one time or or you have, it's, that's, that's the state that you're in. Yeah, they're, I, I think strictly speaking, they're vices. They're, right. There's a habitus. The uh, habitus, in exactly. In the same way that the virtues are habitus. And, uh, and this, you know. yeah, this so is where a So that's the quant state of being. So right. you've got a dynamic orientation in a direction. So you're right. gonna be there on autopilot unless something turns you around or you right. turn yourself around. Some repentance is required. Right. This is exactly what Hume denied. You know, Hume believed that our actions simply went off from us and their effects were entirely in the world external to us and not internal to us. So he misses the whole Aristotelian idea of virtues and, and vices. And I think that's why Aquinas deals with um, the virtues and vices in his section on habitus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which, which is interesting because in Arabic, the word for habitus, which the Latin is the same root, 
So in Arabic, it's malaka, which literally means what you possess. So in the texts of Aquinas, of uh, Aristotle that Aquinas was working with, which had come through the, he, uh, the uh, Arabic, what would the word have been? Would it have been that word? In Arabic, it was, it was malaka, which means it's like a faculty, it's a possession, it's something you've acquired. And that gets to what you just said. I think that the, the default setting is what possesses you. And the habitus is where you take, possess, you take possession. So you actually, you're in control. It's no longer controlling you as a kind of default setting. And hence the, the psychomachia, right? The, this, this battle between the vices and the virtues. In, in, in terms of that battle, um, what are some of the fortifications against uh, a, a greed? And, and why, why do you think uh, greed is, is, it seems to be a, a, a virtue now in, in our culture? There, you know, how, how has it been? You know, Thomas Sowell said that uh, envy was a, a terrible vice, but it was transmuted into a virtue under the name of social justice. Um, and, and so, so what, what has greed, uh, I think success really, he's very successful. There's a, there's a corrupted reading of Adam Smith and the concept of the invisible hand, uh, which was uh, taught to me by my introduction to economics teacher when I was in college with a very simple heuristic device that he used in almost every class to teach us the law of supply and demand and other fundamental economic laws. He would begin by saying, assume greed, assume greed. Then everything else logically would follow from that. Uh, right. And so markets will work efficiently if you assume greed. Uh, now, on that corrupted view of, of Smith, uh, you, you take a vice, greed, and by an invisible hand, it's turned into a virtue. So right. we individually act greedily. The net result for society is the, is the good of prosperity. But I really think that is a corruption of Smith and of this whole tradition of uh, the moral philosophy of economics, which is really what Smith is all about. Smith is not an economist in any modern sense. He's a philosopher. And a moral philosopher, uh, economy. Yes. People forget that economics was the third branch of moral philosophy. He doesn't assume that people will be greedy. I mean, some people will be greedy. There are all sorts of reasons apart from greed, that you might want to have money or wealth. Right. Uh, you might want it for charitable purposes. Right. Uh, you might want it for, not for itself, but for the status that attaches to it. That's not virtuous, but strictly speaking, you're, what you're after there is not the money itself. The miser is after the money itself, but he's a rather pathetic figure. I'd like to talk in our video conversation a bit about the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. Because right. what makes Scrooge so, such a pathetic figure is that he's not after the money for status. He's not after the money uh, to buy things with. <laughs> he doesn't buy anything. He won't even buy an extra piece of bread at dinner. Uh, he's after the money just for its own sake. That's pure greed, but it's clearly a pathology. It does him no good. It does anybody, doesn't do anybody uh, any good. And it's okay. only when the visiting spirits uh, strip away the illusions that have caused him to fall into this mistake of treating money as if uh, it's something good in itself and not simply something instrumentally valuable when it's valuable at all. It's only after the angels or the, the spirits strip that away that he can reform his life. You know, it's interesting that you're bringing that up because the, the miser, it's really about fear, isn't it? Because they fear uh, poverty or they fear, uh, very often they, they come out of impoverished circumstances and there's a fear that they're going to, to go back to that or lose it. Um, and, and it's fear that, you know, Jacob Marley, when he shows up, it's really fear that changes Scrooge, realizing that he's got limited time and he could end up with all those uh, treasure chests uh, chain to him. I mean, we have in our generation, uh, Hamza, 
uh, the memory of our parents and grandparents of being depression children. Right. And that, that caused, I, I think, a tremendous amount of fear. And it caused, you know, people like my father, your father's probably a little younger than my dad. My dad's 95 now. Uh, but it would be your grandfather, maybe. Anyway, people like that to really live in fear, even in times of great prosperity, like the 1950s. Right. Uh, the real fear that we could go back there. Now, of course, we've never, we've never known anything. Our generation has never known Nothing anything. like that. Nothing yeah. like that. So it's hard to appreciate why they would be so scared and why they would err uh, on the side of hoarding. <laughs> One of the things that uh, Dorothy Sayers talks about in her essay, uh, The Six Other Deadly Sins, you know, she, she points out yeah. that a lot... <laughs> A lot of people, like when, when she's mentioned the seven deadly sins, she said people will say, what are the other six? Yeah, everybody knows what the first one is. Right. And, and so, and so uh, she, she talked about how the fact, because she wrote the essay during the war, World War II, and she talks about the fact that it really forced people to address some of those sins uh, it, because of the circumstances that they were forced into it. So she talks about uh, that... The idea, the spendthrift, uh, suddenly becomes thrifty uh, in in straightened circumstances. So people started, for instance, now they encourage you to recycle. People were recycling during World War II. Everything was being recycled because of the necessity, and that gets back to this idea of sumptuary laws, which which um, are to me very fascinating. Because, for instance, I think it was the Second Punic War when the sumptuary laws were introduced because they were so worried about people uh, being uh, too luxurious, right? Yeah. Too, and, and, they, and they would lose that Spartan spirit that enabled them to withstand hardship. And I think this country now, like you said, we've had, we've had an incredibly long run. I don't think people realize, people that know history know that the, the, the type of affluence that our civilization has had and the types of luxuria that has seeped in uh, to this uh, civilization. And I think these deadly sins, I mean, it's very interesting that Gregory um, really, uh, his taxonomy comes uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Romans with, with, the, uh, with, with the sins completely corroding that culture and civilization. And I think, in fact, um, the, the Christians saw greed as, as one of the major, they used to write, uh, apparently, they wrote um, graffiti on the Roman walls, R-O-M-A, from the Radex Omnium, uh, you know, the, uh, the greed is the, the, the root of all evil. So they would actually have an anacronym from uh, Timothy's uh, verse about greed. So they, they saw greed as something that had really destroyed uh, the Romans, partly because of, of the incredible greed and, and corruption in the government. So, I mean, our culture right now seems to be, I, I see the, the, the grip of at least three of these deadly sins. I mean, certainly lust uh, has an incredible grip on this civilization. But envy and, uh, and, and greed seem to be, and anger really, I mean, when it gets down to it, all seven are pretty well established in the American ethos right now. I mean, what do you think? I think it means that civilization or our civilization is in serious trouble. Right. Uh, we have lost our moral moorings, our moral foundations. Uh, we sometimes treat vices as if they're virtues and even treat virtues as if they're vices. And I think we have to get straight about these things. Uh, but it's very hard because once the, once the machine is up and running, people get caught up in that, in that machine uh, and their values get messed up. We have a transvaluation of values, to, to quote that concept of, of Nietzsche's. That while things like wealth, status, prestige, um, achievement are good things in the sense that they're not bad things, they're not bad in themselves. With wealth you can do many good things. You can use your social standing or social status to do many uh, good things. But they are, while they are not bad things, 
their value is merely instrumental. Wealth is not a good in itself. Status is not a good in itself. It's what you do with them that makes them good and, right. and bad. So if those are not the things that are good in themselves, if those are not the things to which we should fundamentally direct ourselves that we should be most concerned about, then what are those things? The things that aren't merely instrumentally valuable. Family, faith, integrity, compassion, looking out for other people, developing a virtuous character, uh, honoring the honorable, beginning with God, but everything else then in God's creation that is honorable. Getting students today to get their values straight is important. In theory, they understand that, but they very rarely advert to it because we have all these media of culture, and I don't just mean the news and entertainment media. I mean all the, uh, the, the mechanisms through which uh, a culture communicates to young people what's important are in effect sending the message that what really matters, what you should really be striving for, are wealth, status, prestige, celebrity, and so forth. And those things, while again, they're not bad in themselves and can be instrumentally good, also open the door to corruption because it's so easy to fall in love with them. Take the approval of other people. Take, take celebrity, things like that. It's very easy to lust for those things, uh, to be greedy about those things, to want more than is good for you or good for anybody. And we human beings, we're very easily addicted to things like applause, things like approval. But if we're addicted, that means that when push comes to shove, and it is our spiritual and moral obligation to stand up against what's wrong, Right. Even when the entire culture is celebrating what's wrong, right. we will hold back from doing it. We will be afraid to do it because our addiction to applause, to approval, stops us, prevents us from speaking out, from standing up for what's right, for, for criticizing what's wrong, for playing the prophetic role that all the great monotheistic traditions see as central, not just for great prophets, not yeah. just for you know Jesus and Moses and Muhammad, but for yeah. all of us, that all of us have an obligation to do that. That gets lost. You know, it's interesting that you're saying that because I think you're somebody that, to me, uh, and one of the things that I admire most about you is that you, 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 you tend to take positions that are, are certainly counter to the zeitgeist and, and um, I remember once you asked me about something and, and I said to you, um, you know, we have to choose our battles. And, and you said to me, no, we have to fear God. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, and I, you know, it, it really affected me when you said that because, you know, the, when you hear the truth, the truth rings loudly in the ear. And, and I think uh, th this is a, it, in many ways, it's, it's a craven age where people, um, you know, they, they're just afraid to, uh, to speak out. And, and I think the, the cancel culture is a good example of that, where, um, it's a, it's a vociferous minority that kind of shouts so loud that people start thinking it's actually the majority. And, and there really is a silent majority of people that just know something's deeply wrong but there's not enough uh, people. And, and too often the people uh, that do speak out are like Cassandra's. They, 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 they you know, the Arabs say, You would have made them hear had you been calling somebody that ha was alive, but unfortunately you're only calling the dead. And, and, and there's a lot of truth to that, but you know, this is the fight that we're in of trying to maintain the virtues of ascendancy in a civilization when we see the vices of descent, uh, when, when that civilization is on its way down, you know, trying to call people back to those. And there's a verse in the chapter called Hud uh, in the Quran that, that says, had, it not, had there not been more people who maintained the virtues of ascendancy, 
when corruption began to uh, come into the culture. And one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that what destroys civilizations, he's, he identified two diseases. He said greed and, and hatred, that they will rip a society apart. Um, and I think, I think at the root of that, it seems to me that one of the daughters of uh, avidity or greed is, is insensitivity to the suffering of others, you know, this lack of mercy. And I think when you have, I mean, when I look at the Quran, when I look at the, the, the New Testament in particular, so much of it deals with calling people to taking care of the less fortunate. And I think the, the problem for me with a lot of the liberal approach to that and the socialistic approach is there's a forced, um, you know, they, they take the wealth from people forcefully and then they redistribute it very often poorly, as has been pointed out by uh, many, many people. And, and certainly all the countries that have adopted that model tend to really suffer greatly. I mean, when, when, uh, when Stalin implemented the collectivist farms in the Ukraine, uh, people, they, they, they didn't want to work in the collectivist farms. So to punish them, he just let them starve to death. And I think they estimate between seven, seven and 14 million people starved to death uh, during that period. It's quite horrific. So this, this idea of just, you know, we know all the evidence shows that religious people donate far more of their wealth than secular people. This has been shown consistently in the social sciences. But really, I think getting to some awareness of how much disparity there is seems to me to be uh, a, a real priority to, to, to prevent the type of social breakdown that naturally will occur uh, when you have these great disparities of, of, of wealth. You know, Hamza, a lot of people on both the political right and the political left, the libertarians and the socialists, tend to think of the problem as a problem involving two poles or two parties, the individual and the state. And the question is how much authority should be in the individual and how much authority should be in the state. And obviously the socialists want to tip things in the direction of more authority for the state. The, uh, the uh, libertarians want to tip things in favor of more authority for the individual. But I've always thought that that misrepresents the question from the beginning and this results in a distorted analysis because really there are three poles or three parties. There is the individual, of course, there is the state, but then also there's the institutions of civil society. Right. Beginning with the family, the religious community. The mosque. The local civic association. Yes, the mosque, the synagogue, the temple, the, the, the church. Uh, the private uh, uh, associations of every description that have to bear in any decent society the lion's share of the burden of providing health, education, and welfare, including to those who are in need. And even with those who are not in need, the institutions that have to play the primary role in bringing up children and, and transmitting to each new generation the, the virtues, the habits of, of heart and mind, that enable people to lead successful lives and be good citizens. But the institutions of civil society vanish in the analysis of both the libertarians and the socialists. The socialists will simply have the state take over the role of the family or right. the mosque or church or, 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 or synagogue or the civic association, or they'll commandeer those institutions of civil society into the service of the instrumentalities of the, of the state, take them over. And of course, the, the libertarians just miss it all, miss the institutions of civil society altogether, and they just want to make sure that the state does not oppress the individual. But I think it, it, it falls to us, um, especially uh, religious people who live our lives in those institutions of civil society. These are, these are our primary homes, even, even, even more primary than, than the nation we belong to, for example. Um, uh, we can be good, loyal, patriotic citizens, but, but you know as a Muslim, I know as a Christian that our first allegiance is to God and therefore our, our very first allegiance is to our, 
our religious community. And that, that shouldn't scandalize anybody. I, I want that to be the case. Uh, I want my fellow Christians to be Christians first, Americans second. Because I think if they're good Christians, they will be good Americans. I want yeah, my Muslim friends to be Muslim first. I know this scandalizes a lot of Christians. They should be Muslims first and right. Americans second. And if they're good Muslims, they'll be good Americans. And same because, for Jews. So um, I, I, I think we need to be in the forefront of reminding everyone, our libertarian friends and our socialist friends, that if we're going to serve the poor, if we're going to serve the young, if we're going to serve the people who are most in need of the delivery of health, education, and welfare, the primary role has got to be played by the institutions of civil society. So I would much rather see the wealthy fulfill their obligations to the needy, right. operating primarily, not exclusively, but primarily through the charities of institutions of faith and other institutions of civil society, and only secondarily through the government and the tax system. I think it's, right. in the Catholic tradition, we call that the doctrine of subsidiarity. Letting the institutions closest to those we are serving yeah. have the resources and have the authority to meet the needs. The distant government doesn't know anybody by name. It doesn't know your children by name. It doesn't know my children by name. It doesn't know the person who uh, finds himself addicted to drugs or the person who is mentally disabled. It doesn't know the person by name. Right. But the local religious institution who reaches out to serve those people know the individuals by name. They, and by name here, I'm using that as a metaphor. They know their particular needs, the circumstances, why they're in the position that they're in, what can be done to help, what has been tried before, what has failed, what might work this time? How do we deal with people? That's why those institutions of civil society are so important. And we've got to get our fellow Americans. This is a very wealthy, prosperous country. There's going to be a lot of money available to help people. But we could blow it or continue to blow it unless we rejuvenate, renew, revive, reinvigorate the institutions of civil society. Well, and, and how, you know, that gets to a, another problem, which is the the bowling alone phenomenon, you know, Putnam's argument about what's happened in 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 America with the the loss of these organizations. I mean, so many of these institutions ha are derelict in a lot of ways. They're 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 neglected, and I mean, you and I, I think, would both agree that government is not very effective at dealing. The amount of money that government had has put into addressing the poverty issue, I mean, we're looking at trillions of dollars. That's right, Tom said, trillions of dollars. It's overwhelmingly beyond belief um, how ineffectual they have been. I grew up in the heart of Appalachia. I grew up in the hills yeah. of West Virginia. Yeah. And uh, although my father was poor growing up, uh, I, I never faced poverty. I, I never lived in poverty but I lived around a lot of poor people. Uh, they were my classmates and they were, they were my friends. They were my father's friends, my family's friends. Uh, and this was at the time when the great society programs were being launched. And it was a time of great excitement and enthusiasm because we all knew that the situation economically in Appalachia was bad uh, and uh, reforms were needed. And we at first had a great deal of hope that the government coming in with huge influxes of money would make a great positive difference and help to get people back up on their, on their feet. But I very quickly saw, even as a young man, that the programs were not only failing very often and very rarely succeeding, but worse than failing, they were counterproductive. They were having negative effects on the very people they were designed to help. And that helped to put me on a path to a different kind of view about politics. I used to be much more favorable toward large governmental programs to, large, to solve large social prob problems. But when I saw, as a young man, the failures, the futility, the counterproductive results of, of these programs, that's when I began to see that we've got to reinvigorate and work through the institutions of civil society.
Although, you know, one of the things about the Muslim community in the United States, which is a very dynamic community, um, they have been able to build uh, mosques all over uh, the country, uh, and largely because they have to rely on themselves. So, you know, in Muslim countries where the state really is the regulator of religion, um, because that's absent here, there's, there's a lot more, I think, energy in the religious yeah. community. Like I've seen how, just how the state intervention in religion kind of kills, it deracinates something very, very important in religion. Um, that, that, that idea of self-reliance, which is so fundamentally American, right back to Emerson, you know, it's just something that I think is a hallmark of the, of the American experiment. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little wary of government intervention um, personally. I think, you know, let me give you an example. When I was a, a very young person across the way here, I grew up in a working class um, town and I remember a, a, a family's house burnt down for weeks after that, buckets came to all the houses and everybody put money in it and the house was rebuilt. And I, I vividly remember this as a, as a, as a youngster. The, what, what that taught me was that's what community is about. And, the, and I grew up in a time where you still knew everybody in a pretty wide, spe like I knew many, many uh, neighbors and we knew them by their names. We always called the parents by Mr. and Mrs. And, uh, you know, so that, that was fire insurance, right? Yeah. And there's a beautiful verse in the Quran that says, help one another in, in righteousness and piety and don't help one another in sinfulness and wrongdoing. And that verse was revealed for Muslims working with people, other people. It wasn't just about Muslims because that was kind of understood, but it was also yeah. working like you and I doing work, the work we did with uh, pornography and other things uh, that we've done. That we, you know, we have so many shared uh, interests um, as well with the Jewish community and including other communities. The Sikhs, the Hindu, the Buddhist communities, that's right. Greed, I think, of, of, of the deadly sins, it's certainly shared by, you know, Lao Tse denounces it in the Tao Te Ching. Uh, the Buddha certainly, I mean, he begins the Four Noble Truths with, you know, desire being at the root of it, which obviously in, uh, in, our, in our languages, um, desire, it's a very interesting word from, from Latin because it means of the stars or from the stars. So there's something heavenly. Uh, desire is a heavenly impulse. Like, you know, our uh, God has made us for him alone and our hearts won't rest until they rest in God. St. Augustine. So, so desire really is something profoundly spiritual. But it can be but, distorted. That's the whole problem. It, it can be distorted. Exactly. It's perverted into these. And I think greed in particular, the perversion of greed to desiring uh, these possessions, you know, this wealth. And, and now I want, as we, you know, to come to a close on this, I want to look at um, what I think is one of the biggest problems in our culture, and that is that we have systems now. I mean, people talk about systems, and I'm very much a, you know, I've been accused uh, uh, of, of being somebody that ignores all these big uh, problems and is always focusing on the heart and on uh, the individual on changing. Yeah, people, people, uh, you Not know. Not on the structures, yeah. Yeah, on the structures. But I would say with greed, I genuinely believe there are serious structural problems. And, and one of them is in usury laws. Um, I, I really feel that the, you know, that usury, which is condemned by everybody. I mean, there's no, even John Maynard Keynes condemned usury. You know, it is just seen as an evil. Plato condemned it, Aristotle condemned it, Buddha condemned it, Christianity condemns it. Aquinas condemns it. Everybody condemns usury. And yet it's just seen now as something so normal in society, and, and it strikes me as very odd because 
the, the Catholics in particular, I mean, the denunciations of usury were so great. And part of the Protestant Reformation, there's a reason why Calvin, the bankers built a statue to Calvin in, in Geneva, you know, for, for unleashing uh, uh, usury. But Calvin never allowed it for poor people. Like you could not loan to poor people. And even in Deuteronomy, apparently the rabbis say that the, the nukri, the, the foreigner or the stranger that they're permitted to engage was the merchant. It was somebody who had wealth. And so I, it strikes me as very odd. Um, yeah. So I think your first point is a terribly important one. Um, why take someone like Calvin? Why does Calvin say, all right, it's morally acceptable in some circumstances to charge interest on a loan, but you can't do it to poor people. Now, why does he say that? Uh, what is being condemned when the traditional faiths and the great thinkers of the traditional faiths, in the Catholic tradition, Aquinas, for example, what exactly is being condemned by the condemnation of usury? Well. We're sometimes tempted to think it's straightforward, it's just charging interest on a loan. That's usually, that's it, it's condemned. I think that's not sufficiently nuanced and doesn't get to the problem. The problem is taking advantage of people's need. Taking advantage for your own benefit of people's need when what you should be doing is reaching out to them with compassion and care. So what is being condemned is the charging of interest in virtue of nothing other than the loan itself. In other words, trying to benefit from no productivity, trying to make money without producing anything or contributing to the production of anything. So it's one thing as part of a productive process to do financing that doesn't, in a competitive market, that drives rates to an equilibrium, that dot, does not take advantage of people in virtue of their want or their desperation. You have somebody who's got a plan, who's got an idea, you can buy into it with a loan structured in a certain way. If you put some moral constraints in place that need to be uh, in place, you haven't done anything wrong. It seems to me that, strictly speaking, that's not what usury is supposed to condemn. But where you're trying to make money without contributing anything, or make money out of air, as they sometimes say, uh, where you're simply taking advantage of another person's need to enrich yourself, that's usury. And, and what tradition of faith, what tradition that believes God is the Father of all, what tradition that, that, that holds that, that all mankind, irrespective of race or ethnicity or religion or anything else, are God's children, is going to say that's okay. Well, no tradition is going to say that's okay, which is why you find this ubiquity, you find this universality that you were talking about, Hamza. It's not just Islam, it's Judaism, it's Christianity, it's Buddhism, it's, uh, uh, it's the Confucian uh, tradition, all saying basically the same thing. Don't take advantage of people's want to enrich yourself. It's okay to try to, to, to build wealth, that's fine for yourself, for your family, for the causes you believe in, but do it by making productive contributions, not by taking advantage of other people's need. I can take you right down the road to some of the poorest areas here, and they have these payday loans. For those of us who, you know, can go to the nice bank, right, and, 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 and quote unquote reasonable rates, those poor people are being exploited by those same banks that tell you how helpful they are to everybody. But and this I is what Calvin was condemning, Hamza, isn't it? Isn't this exactly what Calvin was condemning? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. right. He's not condemning yeah. Citibank making a loan. But my point is nobody condemns, it any, nobody condemns it anymore. It's just not even talked about. And I find it very strange. And sometimes it's dressed up as a virtue. So people say, well, this is, a, this is a way of getting immediate cash into the hands of people who need immediate cash. But what we're not dealing with is the underlying problem of the want. Why are they in want? Why are they in such desperate need? What are we doing to put them into a position where they can earn a decent living? We, we, you know, we could uh, continue this on uh, 
it's it's a fascinating topic and and i'd i'd love to explore the other six with you as well but um i really appreciate your uh your time i know you're a very busy man and uh, but you've always been generous with your time and uh i look forward to further collaborations treasure and cherish our opportunities to work together and i hope we'll have many more going forward Thanks for coming. I've always found the seven deadly sins a compel compelling um, assessment of some of the fundamental problems in the in the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really from the Islamic tradition, we, although all of them are in are identified as problems. The way that they're structured in the uh, in the Catholic tradition as being kind of the root, the radix, you know, the root. Of, uh, of, of the problems uh, intrigues me. But greed, which is the one I wanted to talk about with you, is, is a fascinating problem because economics, and, and I think the Jews and the Muslims share this, that economics is so central to both traditions. Like out of the 613 uh, uh, mitzvahs, yeah, that about 120 apparently, I mean this one rabbi I read said about 120 deal with economics, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a large bulk. Our, one of the most fundamental books in our tradition, which is called the Muatta, uh, which is basically um, the first major collection of hadith, a third of it deals with economics. Mm. And, and one of the things about both the Bible and the Quran, it's filled with verses about economic justice and mm -hmm. treating uh, people uh, with dignity and taking care of the orphan, taking care of the widow, taking care of the poor, um, you know, giving back from what you've been given. The, actually, the very beginning of the Quran says that, you know, those who believe in God, believe in the unseen, all the things that go with the unseen, mm -hmm. and from what they have been given, give out, you know. So it's very interesting because one of the, one of the fundamental things about being human is breathing, which is taking in and then exhaling, right? We have to exhale. We, we take in food, we have to defecate mm -hmm. and, and urinate. And, I find it fascinating. I don't know about Hebrew, but in Arabic, the word for greed, aphorishia, uh, avarice, and the word for constipation is the same really? in Arabic, imsak. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I can't remember what, what, I don't know that there's a word that's exactly like greed, um, but, uh, um, but greed is always under attack in, in, the, in the Bible, and I mean in the Torah in a very strong way. Right. And, um, but I don't think that's the term that's used, but it's, um, you know, the, the Torah is filled with commands about how to treat other human beings. And, um, uh, and in particular, around the issue of um, not assuming that you have a right to um, maximize your wealth without regard to the, con the consequences for others. Right. So we live in a society where this part of Torah has been very deeply underplayed in the synagogues, um, in those synagogues where people were seeking to make it in America, um, to ascend the ladder, so to speak. Because most Jews who came here in the 1880s to the 1920s, say, until when they cut off immigration, the, when the country cut off immigration because there were too many foreigners right, coming, coming here. In, yeah. Although, of course, everybody here was a foreigner originally except right. Native Americans. Sure. But anyway. Well, there have always been a nativist. Right. The Anglo-Saxons have always seen themselves as a privileged group. I mean, my ancestors were Irish who mm. came here yeah. and had a horrible time. My Great grandfather actually hid their Irish roots just mm. because upward mobility uh, demanded that in the type of work he was doing. Right, but up, upward mobility um, was so central to the aspirations of uh, Jews and many other people, particularly after the. Well, that's uh, why a lot of people come here, isn't it? Um, it's definitely one one of the motivations, although 
most of the family that I have that came here came here to avoid being persecution. Um, yeah, because in uh, in 1880, the Tsar declared that his policy would be one third of the Jews have to leave, one third of the Jews have to be killed, and one third of the Jews have to be forced to convert to Christianity. Right. And that was just uh, an expression of the reality that had been um, really since uh, at least the time of Constantine, right. about 320 right. B B C uh, of the current era. Well, the okay. Jewish community, they were always the, 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 the release the government used for the pressure on the people. It was all to direct. I mean, this was done in England. Yes. You know, it, it was done in France. It was yeah. done in Spain. I mean, so many places. Uh, it's a way, I think, of getting around the real problems that are engulfing us. Yeah. And I think greed seems to be at the root of a lot of these problems. I, I agree, it is. And, um, and what I want to say is, is that um, both my book, which I'll I get to in a second, but the Torah, okay, is deeply concerned about this issue. And um, and, and in particular, letting people, um, ins insisting that people at least draw strong boundaries around that. And one of those boundaries is that for six days a week you can work, but on the Shabbos, on Sabbath, you have to shut things down. You can't, uh, you can't touch money. Right. You can't buy anything. Mm. You can't, in other words, you can't get involved in the the endless pursuit yeah. of more. Now, that, is, that has been a very strongly um, policed, as I should say, in the, in the religious community. Sure. And, um, and when I became religious, um, it was a problem for my parents because I was saying, hey, you're not doing the right thing. But on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, yeah. right. Because yeah. uh, uh, my father would go to synagogue and afterwards he would say, okay, now I'm going to get this, um, uh, I'm going to drive down to the, uh, my workplace. To... So and it was, uh, he was a lawyer and, uh, and worked a lot of, of the time. So, um, yeah, there was, uh, and so there was Shabbos. Okay, right. that was, but then there was something even more extreme, the sabbatical year. Right. The sabbatical year said that, for, that the, every seventh year, you can't work your land. Now, this was to a people who uh, were totally Subsisted agrarian. Subsisted on farming. Yeah. yeah, farming was the whole yeah. way we lived. Instead, God said... You leave it fallow, and then it, it replenishes. You not only leave it fallow, but um, you make the land... Um, the, the word uh, was... Um, uh, it's... it's um, belongs to everyone. Right. It doesn't belong to like you. Like a commons. It's like a commons for that year. So um, anybody who is hungry right. can come and eat. The animals who may well, be also hungry. Also the gleanings, even in the years that they, that they harvested, the gleanings were always left for the poor people. I mean, they... Yeah. They well, that, that was to, during every harvest that you were supposed to leave anything that fell off your... Right. Head. The gleanings, they called them. All right. Yeah. So, but, but on the seventh year... It was... You couldn't, you were not allowed. Now, you were allowed to pick something for yourself. Sure. But you could not pick anything that you were going to sell. Right. Okay. And, and you had to allow no, no boundaries that would keep out poor people or hungry uh, or animals that were hungry. Right. Okay. So, um, and then finally, the, the, um, the culmination of that was the, uh, the Jubilee. The Jubilee was the, the free the debts the fiftieth year yeah. in which all well debts all debts were canceled, canceled. and all um, and all ownership was canceled right. so everybody was set sent back to wherever their original again. tribe was right. and you started all over yeah. okay so yeah. these are genius solutions to a lot of problems yeah. I, I want to. I I <laughs> still want to put this on the ballot, uh, okay, in the yeah. United States. Good luck. And, I, I've, and in that, in my book, um, uh, um, Revolutionary Love, I talk a little bit about what it might look like yeah. for us to have an economy that was based on on this kind of biblical vision. Yeah. Um, because I believe it it 
it helps cure the soul of some of the greed. Not totally, because you're living in a society in which is so deeply based in capitalist values that are, and those capitalist values are, look out for number one. Maximize your own interest without regard to the consequences right. for others. And if you don't do that, everybody else will. So you're a fool, um, you're unrealistic, and you're really self-destructive if you don't um, put your own interests above everybody else. But I, yeah, I think a lot of these uh, problems stem from the loss of religious tradition because all, all these religious traditions, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, I, Buddhist, Hindu, they all had ways of mitigating acquisitiveness, you know, this idea of that we're here just to acquire and, mm -hmm. and get more. Uh, right. They all had ways of trying to purify the self of that because it's very natural. I mean, these are these are these are the natural sins. You know, it's in 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 the purgatorio, the uh, these sins of um, you know you have that middle sin of sloth, mm -hmm. but then you get into the first one on the top of purgatorio of the mount is mm -hmm. is greed mm -hmm. and then gluttony and then lust mm -hmm. because there and lust was the least of them because you're literally at the top, you're almost in paradise now. <laughs> and, and it was because that was the most natural. Right. So gluttony, you know, the, the gluttony is, the, is, is, a, is a perversion of the love of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Lust is a perversion of the love of the preservation of the species. The acquisitiveness is a very interesting, cupidity is about desire, but it's a perversion of love of what is good, the goods, mm -hmm. you know, that make life uh, really um, not just bearable, but actually uh, enjoyable, uh -huh. you know, the, the basic necessities that we need. But that gets perverted into this desire for more and more and more. And it's a very corrupting and corrosive. And I think all of our religious traditions really warn people about this. And I don't see that warning anymore. I mean, I, I feel like so little is talked about the problem of greed in our culture. I mean, we have these, apparently there's programs about these things, American Greed, which is like, it'll have somebody like um, uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what he did, or, or, mm -hmm. or some other greedy person who did this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. But it's, for me, it's like, you know, it's turtles all the way down, it's greed all the way down. Like, this is a deeply human problem that transcends, you know, just the institutional problems of it, and there are. So you'll allow me to, to slightly take issue with you, okay? No, absolutely. Um, you, so, can, you can um, slightly or, or <laughs> largely or however you want. Um, yeah, I, I believe that this is a problem of the, the um, combination of the emergence some eight to 10,000 years ago of class societies and patriarchy. And um, now that was, that's the last eight to 10,000 years of our history, but there were 90,000 years before that, okay, in which greed wasn't the major way that people re related to each other. On the contrary, there was at least reasonable evidence, nothing conclusive because it was before we have, um, we have uh, the kinds of things that count as total certainty about what's going on, but most of what we see and what we, we hear from the stories that people brought, um, in, brought about that time indicated a high level of caring for each other, at least in your tribe. And, um, but there was a problem, namely that there wasn't enough food around. So they were hunter-gatherers. The people who started capitalism, uh, or at least whatever we'll call the world of ownership of the land, okay, that was a brand new concept 10,000 well, years ago. Well, I mean, ago. according to the Talmud, I thought um, when, when, when Cain was banished to the land of Nod, he sets up the first city and demarcates the first property boundaries. I mean, that's pretty early, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, I'm not convinced of that argument. I think it's a very romantic argument. It's kind of, kind of nostalgic yeah. way of looking at the past. Human nature, to me, is human nature. I lived with tribal people, and I actually really, like, I lived with Bedouin, and, uh, and they, they're living the way they've lived for millennia, probably. I mean, Bedouin means the first people in Arabic. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So they really are the first nation. And they definitely do take care of themselves, but there's discrepancies, among, there's more successful ones. For instance, there's people that had more cows than the other people in the group that I was with. They had more camels, they had nicer tents, yeah. um, they had better stuff. There's always going to be these things, but do you envy them or do you see it as God's blessed him? I have to be more patient. Maybe God will bless me down the road. I mean, it's, it's a very different way spiritually of looking at it. So I think, I still think the desire is there, but it does get perverted. And I, and I mean, we could debate all day long mm -hmm. about nature and nurture and is it our societies that are doing this to us? Because I do think this culture does a lot of damage to people in terms of getting priorities uh, but, right. right. But you know, um, uh, when, when uh, the, um, it, in the uh, 15th and 16th century, when um, w European countries started to get the idea of colonizing others, there were many reports that came back about um, how the people there were, were really um, not really human. And the reason that they gave was they, they work as long as they have to to feed themselves and their family, and then they stop. Right. And they don't have the idea of accumulating more than they need. Right. Um, so, uh, and, and this was... Uh, well, I think a lot of tribal peoples are like that. Yeah. I mean, I, the people I lived with, they pretty much, all their possessions could be put onto a camel. Right. So greed wasn't, I wouldn't call it greed. When the, what, what they were trying to do was to get what Greed they, is a disease of the heart. I right. Mean, yeah. So, but when, but um, the, uh, the emergence of a capitalist class um, came in contrast to the values of uh, the Catholic Church that ran most of Europe in the, uh, in the Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages. And the, 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 um, the big objection to that was that the, uh, the, Catholic the Catholics had a vision of a fair price for, um, for um, what you were sell and a fair, um, fair re, re, um, out salary to those who work for you. And the early capitalists were, uh, struggled against that. And what they came up with was the idea of freedom. And what they meant by freedom was being free from to anybody others. telling us yeah. what we should do. Right. We want to be totally free to do whatever we want to do. Yep. But the actual way that it emerged was we want to be free to be greedy. We want to be free to get as much as we want and pay as little yeah. as we want to the working people. Now you can say, oh well, that everybody we know subsequently in the last 400 years has, has shown greed. I'm saying to you, it was not, I mean, we have this disagreement, okay? We, no, um, I, don't th I actually I, don't think we're disagreeing. I mean, I would agree with you fundamentally with, with what you're saying. I think there's definitely a lot of truth to that. Um, and, and like I said, I think the, the desire to better oneself is a very natural desire that, that I think all human beings have. When it becomes pathological is when it, it, it begins to oppress others. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the word in Arabic for um, desire and oppression is the same, one of the words, bari. It it's literally means to desire something and to oppress something. I mean, Naboth is a good example if we, if we look at the... Uh, you know, with Ahab and Jezebel, and mm -hmm. I mean, he wanted the vineyard. Yeah, right. But so he's, he's already in a, a society that has had had uh, about five thousand years worth of class society. But the whole idea that you can own the land is one that is that, and and that you can, and that you have a right to own own the land, which was the primary form of of uh, of wealth. That's one that God in the Torah says, okay, because God says, okay, I know there's going to be people who are going to object to this and say, this is my land. And so God says back, and this is in um, Leviticus, God says, Ki li the whole land is mine. It's mine. It's and God. you are yeah. you're sojourners. Stewards. You're stewards. Yeah. You're sojourners here. here. Yeah. You know, you know, you're here yeah. for a little while. Yeah. The whole land is mine. I'm telling you that you've got to stop 
focusing on maximizing your own well-being and share what you have with others. Mm. And so that is a counter tradition to, to what I, maybe I misunderstand you, but that I think that you're attributing to human nature and I'm saying, no, it's not that way. And so like I grew up in my, my grandfather, my, both my grandparents actually on both sides, when they had extra time, they sat down and they studied Torah. They studied the Bible. They loved to study, okay? They loved to do that. They didn't, they weren't thinking, how do we get more? It was- I mean, that's, look, I'm, that's the way I am. Like it's, I, it's not my nature. I'm not, an, I'm not somebody who wants to acquire a lot of things. I mean, books maybe, I, I, <laughs> I, I do like books. Right. Um, but, but I'm not, if, if anything, I have acquisitive, nature for knowledge, like I really like knowledge. And our prophet, peace be upon him, he said, two things the son of Adam will never uh, grow weary of, uh, hunting after the world or hunting after knowledge. Mm. Like the, it's an insatiable quest. Like once you set out to try to, uh, to, to, to uh, acquire the world, mm -hmm. it's an insatiable quest. I mean, the word, you know, in, 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 uh, in uh, greed, apparently, the old English word, it comes from a German word which means hungry, mm -hmm. right? It's, 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 but it's an insatiable hunger, yeah. you know? And in fact, I think avidity as well, uh, ava in, uh, in Latin is also to crave or to hunger something, right. you know? So, so there are people clearly that have these problems um, of even hoarders, I mean, this is, this is a pro it's a human problem, and I don't think we can just dismiss it as being a, a, a structural problem. I mean, I think structure participates in it, but I think you're still dealing with, with the nature of human beings. And I think, you know, my dad and I, when I was very young, mm -hmm. I, I, I took a much closer position to your position okay. um, with my dad. Uh -huh. And and he used to you know say you suffer from the Rousseauian fallacy you know, <laughs> that because he was much more a kind of Hobbesian view of uh, human nature and it seems to be these are two views of nature but I think there's a lot more evidence even in in pre-modern societies I mean if you look like here the Camacheria do you have you do you know about Native American history like the the Comanche what they you know they had a huge um, area that they controlled and they were like Spartans. They were great warrior people. Um, they took other natives as slaves. Other natives mm -hmm. paid them uh, tribute. I mean, we have the Aztecs, if you read like the conquest of Mexico and look at the Aztecs, I mean, they had, you know, they were sacrificing on average about 20,000 people a year just to their gods. I mean, human beings, it's just, I don't know, even in primitive societies, mm -hmm. it seems that the nature is not the kind of Rousseauian noble savage. One of the most uh -huh. interesting things for me of seeing once uh, a footage of an Amazonian tribe that had never been, uh, had contact with Western people and some anthropologists had footage of them. They come out of the forest with their bows, like just perched. And one of the things about, you know, anthropologists call it pseudo speciation. You know, that like I lived with tribal people and I think within the tribe, it's very nice, but well unto a tribe that comes on to their watering places and messes with it mm -hmm. without permission because they'll go to war over it. And, and so I think, again, even well, if you look at people, Aboriginal peoples, they had a sense of property. They had a sense of tribal land. You didn't just go on to, to another tribe's land. I mean, Lakota and Pawnee Wars were about hunting grounds before we mm -hmm. got here well first of all i don't know when we got here but like uh, <clears throat> they also got here from someplace yeah okay and uh, uh many of those indian tribes came from um uh russia crossing the mongolia mongolia right etc so um okay we have a difference of opinion about this okay i'm i still maintain that um, there were societies where um, when they were hoarding, they were hoarding because they didn't have enough. 
but for a good part. And so, yes, of course, they're going to want to protect their whatever source they have because it's because the, the, the water isn't guaranteed from the heavens. You know, it requires some energy to put in. But what I'm saying to you is, OK, I'm coming from a different tradition. My tradition says um, it's possible to build a different kind of world. The so, Jewish tradition is my tradition. We, Muslims acknowledge the Jewish tradition as from God. Like yeah. our prophets are your prophets. Like we, the only difference, we accept Jesus and we accept the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as the last prophet, even though many rabbis, enlightened rabbis, recognize the Prophet Muhammad as a providential force. You know? Yeah, I, but, I do, and as I, as I also represent Jesus as so, one of, so one of I our best say, Jews. So I wouldn't say Jewish we come prophets. from a different tradition. And we both recognize, both of our traditions recognize that people are stewards, like we are, we're, we're passing through. None of us, we're nomads in that way. We're all nomads in that way. Right. We're, we're passing through this world. You can't take it with you, as they say. Right. And, and in our tradition, the wisest people are the ones that are most detached from the world. Uh, the people that give away their goods, the people that, the Quran mm -hmm. says, they ask them, what do we spend out? Uh, from, and, and, and the Quran says, what you have extra, in other words, what you don't need. And so needs and wants are very important distinctions. Yes. Like what we need. I mean, I learned from living with Bedouin, we need very little. And I know that I could live with very, very little yes. in my life because I lived for seven years with Bedouin people. And I experienced, I had no, I mean, I literally had a handful of books and, and a, a couple of, uh, garments just to, to, mm -hmm. to wear on my back. I didn't need anything. Right. So I, I don't think we're, we're in uh, any disagreement about that fundamental thing. But we are, while we are caretakers, I do believe that our traditions both acknowledge property. And I think even Aboriginal peoples that share in the commons many things, his teepee is his teepee. He might invite you in but it's his teepee. If you try to take it from him, he's going to fight you. And I mm. think that's human nature. Well, as I said, our tradition, uh, the, the, seven, the sabbatical year is one that weakens your connection to the notion of property. And the Jubilee eliminates it entirely. You, you have to give up whatever you've had and go back to your original starting place so that, so, um, you no longer own whatever you bought along the way or whatever you know, came to you as a result of market relationships, you have to give it up. But let me just switch for a second to, uh, to another point because um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about revolutionary love and at least one central idea, which is, I mean, lo central, revolutionary love means recognizing the, the possibility of loving everybody on the planet, of caring equally for everybody on the planet. And of course, most people will say in a capitalist society, well, that's impossible. We can't even, you know, we can't even love our neighbor, much less. But the Torah is based on this, this notion of love the stranger, love the other, the one that you don't know, the people who you don't. So that's the basis of my book, Revolutionary Love. But what I say in there is a strategy for today um, which is, in my view, an anti-capitalist strategy, is this, that we need a new bottom line, that today productivity, efficiency, and rationality are judged to the degree that any institution maximizes money or power or, um, or what you'd call success, one would call success. And the new bottom line says, no, um, the, we should judge institutions efficient, rational, and productive and I say, by that institutions, I mean the economy, the, uh, the legal system, the educational system, uh, the cultural system, um, our, uh, 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 our healthcare system for sure, uh, should be judged efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and environmental sensitivity, enhance our capacity to see other human beings and treat them as embodiments of the holy, and to look at the universe not, and, the, and the earth, not primarily from the standpoint of, can I turn something into a product and sell it and make a buck, but rather looking at it with awe and wonder and radical amazement at the grandeur of all creation. I'm not, you have me. I'm on board. Great. Yeah. No. I, just, just sign right here. <laughs> right on this. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, 
I, I that's the new bottom line. That should be the new bottom line. I couldn't agree with you more. I, you know, the there's so many things that, um, well, need fixing isn't even an adequate idiom for it. I mean, there there really is so many things have gone profoundly wrong with 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 uh, with the way we live our lives. And I think in many ways the way we live our lives is causing people to be really ill. Like, I mean, I think a lot of the mental illness, I think a lot of the, the unsettled nature of people. I mean, one of the daughters in, in, uh, in the tradition, you know, because these, these diseases of the heart have daughters, and so, I mean, they call them daughters, the virtues have daughters as well. So it's mm -hmm. more about fecundity, like that they, they mm -hmm. produce, uh, uh, the virtues have daughters that produce other virtues, and mm -hmm. then the vices have daughters that produce other vices. But the, uh, one of the, the um, daughters of greed is restlessness. You know, that people are unsettled in their being. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just not... And you see that with so many people. He needs Shabbat. Yeah. He needs, he do, needs... do you know what Lewis Mumford said about Sabbath? Have you ever seen that? No, tell me. Yeah, I, did, I have you read did. Mumford? But yes, sir. Yeah, I, I really like Mumford. He, he's kind of... I think he fell out of favor, but he, people read him in the 60s. But he thought that Sabbath was a way of shutting down the mega machine. Like he just felt like it's, it was put in there to bring it all to a grinding halt. Exactly. It's yeah. just, there's a, a popular book now called um, um, How to Do Nothing. And, um, yeah. and uh, That's Shabbat, the, Shabbos yeah. is about that. It's yeah. about not stop doing yeah. and start rejoicing Being. at the grandeur of the yeah, universe. Take, you know, take a full 25 hours before, from right. starting really an hour before sunset right. to an hour after sunset yeah. on Saturday night um, to just celebrate the universe. Yeah. To not, don't act on it. Mm. Don't cook. Yeah. Don't, you know, it, make it yeah. a day in which and and I've just read some texts in um, yeah. where the where in the medieval medieval period of Jewish life they they extended that to and don't let the women work either right. you, you know nice don't, yeah no, don't let right. the women work in yeah. your kitchen or something yeah, like yeah. that no, that's good. okay sure so re relax on that's, this day that, that's yeah. the Buddhist solution don't don't just um, don't just do something sit there right. right yeah right but this is like slightly more than that because it's it's not just sit there, but look at the grandeur of well, this I universe. Well, I think that's the meditate, you know, I mean, that's uh, a, yeah. Yeah, celebrate the grandeur of this universe. Yeah. It's so amazing. Yeah. Instead of looking at it continually from the standpoint of what can I get from well, it. Well, time is not money. For, for us, time is life. And, exactly. And, and we live time. Right. We, we don't, you know, so that, that equation that time is money is a horrible, really? um, terrible my, equation. You know, my teacher at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, he was my mentor. I, I read his book on Lemoinity. Yeah. yeah. So he, he, um, he used to say um, that um, uh, Sabbath is holiness in time. Nice. And um, he said that, you know, there are other religions whose primary holiness is in space. He said, Judaism's holiness is in time. Yeah. It's transforming time yeah. to be a sacred vehicle for connecting to yeah. the God of the universe. Islam is in time and space. Yeshikach, congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because we, we do, we have, uh, you know, Baraka. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a Hebrew as well. Baruch. Baruch, yeah. yes. Yeah, so Baraka is both, there's time Baraka and then there's space Baraka. Yeah. So certain places have more Baraka than other yeah. uh, places. So you can experience that. Yeah. Like the, to I mean, the tombs of the righteous. I want to um, yeah. end, because uh, we're coming to a close here, okay. but I want to end on an interesting fact that I was looking at. In 1916, we had the first billionaire. Mm. That was um, John D. Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. um, who actually loaned my great grandfather money to uh, to um, mine in uh, in Minnesota, you know, uh -huh. which is Lakota land, Minnesota. Yeah. And uh, I actually asked um, Chief Arvel Looking Horse if he could find it in his heart to forgive my ancestors mm -hmm. for doing that. Which uh, initially we were having breakfast. Do you know him? Have you ever met Chief Arvel? No. He's the traditional pipe carrier of the Lakota. Uh -huh. 
And uh, so we, we did some things together. He's a really interesting man. But he, um, you know, I was having breakfast, and then I told him what my grandfather had owned all these iron ore mm -hmm. mines up in uh, that Wasabi Range. And he just kind of turned away from me. And, and uh, I was like, oh, this was really stupid. You know, I shouldn't have brought that up. The next day, we were on a panel together, and uh, they were asking, if to, uh, it was an interfaith panel, and they, they, they asked this question, you know, to think of something that you really appreciate about another person's tradition. And Chief Arvel said, I don't really know any other traditions but my own, um, but I will say that uh, as, a, as the Lakota pipe carrier, I'm not allowed to hold any rancor in my heart. Uh, and if I can't uh, fulfill that, I have to give up the pipe. And he said, so I just want to embrace my brother, Hamza, and just let him know that I forgive his family. <laughs> Give me a hug. Very nice. Yeah, it was very nice. Very beautiful. Yeah. But anyway, in 2009, there were 793 billionaires in the United States. And in 2016, 1,810. Yeah. And now there's over 2,000. And I, you know, it just makes the me wonder, like, you know, this tr massive transfer of wealth that's happening, especially COVID, has mm -hmm. been this huge opportunity yes. for uh, this class of people that are a rarefied elite in our culture. I mean, they could all fit into a, you know, relatively small hall. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the th th I just read today that the three richest uh, men in, uh, in America have more wealth than the, the bottom 50% of the population. Right. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Three people who have more wealth than the, the bottom 50% of the population. And it's just unbelievable. And there's so much good that those people could do if they kept the first two billion for themselves yeah. and then shared the rest with everybody else and made it possible. We, we have, we have um, people literally starving on our streets. Yeah. We have people, I mean, not just a few people, uh, thousands, you know, millions of people are in desperate, desperate need of health care and they can't get it. This is why I'm saying to you that <laughs> it is a system issue, not well, just no, an individual it, person. No, I we have a, a I, huge system that validates selfishness and greed. And this is, and that greed is reinforced daily in the experience of the work world and the distribution of goods and services. So you have to change that. Now, of course, you also have to change people individually, and that's why you have to work yeah, on I, both I mean, fronts. I think you work on both fronts, yeah. I, I would agree. I think there's a lot of things that structurally need to change in, 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 the, in our world, undeniably. Great. Okay. Well, it's good to see you again, and I'm, I'm glad, you know, you, you've been a, a, out there for a long time doing Fighting the Good Fight, so. Okay, thank you so much for having me.